I'm Zoe Dillahunty Light, and I'm about to tell you the pathetic lore of Godric the Grafted, a coward, delusional tyrant, and murderer. This is the third video in my Elden Ring lore series, so you can check out the other videos I've made on Rani and Radan. The sad story of Mog and Morgoth is coming in the next video, so keep an eye out for that as it'll also explain what exactly omens are. Okay, on to Godric the Grafted and how much of an asshole he is slash was. Godric is a distant relation of Queen Marika the Eternal, so isn't quite as powerful or revered as the other demigods of the Lands Between. And he knows it. Last of the Golden Lineage and of Godfrey, the first Elden Lord's blood, Godric is held in contempt by many due to his thirst for power and penchant for grafting. Godric is described as a feeble man who sought power through the grotesque act of grafting, meaning it was pretty obvious to everyone in the lands between that he was grafting to try and compensate for his weak nature. Grafting is when you attach the limbs of other soldiers to yourself or create entirely new spider-like beings using many, many limbs, both of which gives you extra physical strength but ends up making you look like this. All Godric really wanted was to be worthy of the Golden Lineage and live up to the example set by the dead Godwin the Golden and his father, Godfrey the First Elden Lord, as he was Godfrey's heir. However, he went about it completely the wrong way. First, he styled himself as Godric the Golden, attempting to emulate Godwin the Golden. So people started to call him Godric the Grafted as a kind of cruel nickname. There's more evidence that he was trying to ape Godwin in that moment that he uses a dragon head as a grafted arm in the boss fight. Godwin is known for his communion with dragons, for example, he befriended the dragon Fortisax who tried to save him from death's clutches, and considering Fortisax founded a dragon cult in the lands between, Godwin could have been involved in that too. So yeah, Godric has some deep-seated issues around Godwin and being good enough to be part of the Golden Lineage. Furthermore, during the boss fight, you can see Godric is wearing green. This is a tiny detail, but I think it's important. Green was the colour of the robes young noble children would wear when they begun to become independent. So to the nobles in the lands between, this green cloak probably made Godric look childish. It was probably a weird way of him trying to show he was independent from the Golden Lineage at the same time as wanted to be a part of it, which just further demonstrates how conflicted he was all around. There's only a little information about his time before the shattering in Elden Ring, and I'm afraid it doesn't paint him in a good light. Bear in mind that warriors, soldiers, and champions were, by the signs of it, revered in the lands between, with war being commonplace as the Erd Tree spread its order across the regions. With all that in mind, the Tarnished is told by Kenneth Haight that Godric cast an insult at Melania, and in the subsequent fight, Godric was easily beaten by Melania. Duh. Godric begged at her feet for forgiveness, which wasn't a good look in the eyes of the people looking on. It might have saved his life, but it earned him even more disdain of the lands between. Now, you might be thinking to yourself that at least grafting was something that Godric came up with all by himself to make himself distinctive. Nope. Signs point to him stealing this trait from his closest relation, who we don't hear much about, possibly a brother or a cousin named Godefroy the Grafted. He can be found within the Golden Lineage Everjail and drops a Godfrey icon upon his death, indicating he's part of the Golden Lineage too. Godefroy is just as grafted as Godric, so those are signs that Godric might have just stolen this favourite pastime of Godefroy in order to make himself more powerful. He really hasn't had one original idea in his entire life. During the first defence of Laindel, ancient dragon knight Kristoff was the one who caught and imprisoned Godefroy, implying that this guy did some shady stuff. Plus, if you look in the ornamental straight sword description, it says that the dregs of the Golden Lineage looked to the past to try and find power. All of that, in my head at least, adds up to mean that Godric imitated Godefroy and learned from him that grafting was the way to go if you wanted to become powerful. Okay, enough with the psychoanalysis. When Radan attacked Laindel during the Shattering, Godric fled by disguising himself as part of the women and children who deserted the capital. The Golden Mimic Veil, named Marika's Mischief, clarifies the fact that Godric used it to flee, earning even more derision among the populace. Upon fleeing Laindel, Godric took over the castle of Stormvale, becoming its lord. And if you didn't despise Godric enough already, 
how about I throw some animal cruelty into the mix? He cruelly twisted huge lion beasts into guardians for Stormvale Castle, which just shows how little regard he had for actually trying to emulate Godwin or Godfrey. Neither of them would have abused animals in such a way, especially considering the lion is the symbol of the Golden Order. Doubtless, Godric wanted these lion guardians because they symbolise the Golden Order, but instead of actually trying to train them and treat them well, he just used them as some kind of signifier, indicating he didn't really understand the gravity and respect he should be showing to the Golden Lineage, which, coincidentally, is also why people despised him. Grafting was held in such suspicion and disdain by the Lands Between that there were rumours that the mottling and thorns infesting Stormvale Castle was a curse instigated by grafting, which actually isn't true, but does indicate how people saw grafting, an unnatural, cursed act. During his lordship of Stormvale Castle, Godric made Edgar the Warden of Castle Morn, so he did have some power at least. During his tenure at Stormvale, Godric and his soldiers started to hunt Tarnished, sacrificing them for grafting and creating the grafted scions in the process. Sacrificing, by the way, is how it's always described when limbs are taken for grafting. Interesting choice of words, don't you think? Roderica, the spirit tuner's retinue, were also taken to be grafted, with her calling Godric the Spider. Godric may have targeted Tarnished because they were the exiled people, so he potentially held them in lower regard. Or he wanted to try and meld Godfrey's people with his own body to try and get closer to the Elden Lord, as Godric himself isn't Tarnished, but Godfrey sure is. Finally, Godric meets the Tarnished, further showing just how delusional he is, he commands the Tarnished to kneel, claiming he's the lord of all that's golden. Finally, his last words are, Great Godfrey, didst thou witness, trying to prove himself to Godfrey even in death. Godric doesn't get a peaceful demise even when he's dead though, with gatekeeper Gostock stamping on his remains while yelling insults at him. Just shows how much hatred his staff had for him, if you ask me. Nefali Lu will doubtless be a better ruler of Stormvale because the bar is so goddamn low. Let's move on to Godfrey, the first Elden Lord who Godric was trying to impress so badly. Godfrey, the first Elden Lord and consort of Queen Marika the Eternal, was respected in the lands between. However, he wasn't without fault and had a ceaseless lust for battle that he found hard to rein in. To fight that urge, he took the beast regent Serosh as his counsellor, binding him with his body to suppress that thirst for war. Serosh himself used to be Lord of the Beasts, but was elevated to become one with Godfrey and become regent in his own right, a position that I've not seen any other being hold. It's possible that being a regent is some kind of variegation of being a shadowbound vassal like Malekith. However, Godfrey is an Empyrean, so it's more likely that the beast regent role is one created especially for Serosh. During his reign as the first Elden Lord, Godfrey was served by the Crucible Knights. Crucible Knights are those that have been touched by the Crucible, which is the primordial form of the Erd Tree and manifestation of the Erd Tree's primal vital energies. Basically, think of it as a melting pot of all life that existed before it was like selectively bred into the Erd Tree, which had all the positive traits of the Crucible without any of the negative ones. Those who come into contact with the Crucible can grow horns, scales, wings, sacks on their chest and the like, as having touched the raw essence of life, their biology turns a bit unpredictable. In the ancient past, being touched by the Crucible in this way would have been a signifier of the divine, but by the time the Tarnished enter the lands between, it's looked down upon as an impurity. This goes on to inform how omens, demi-humans, albinorix and misbegotten are treated, which I'll talk about in later videos. Bear all of that in mind for this next bit, as I have a theory that the Crucible plays a big part of why Godfrey was exiled from the Lands Between. Godfrey was crucial in the war against the Giants, which occurred at the beginning of the Erdtree's existence. As the forces of the Elden Ring spread order throughout the Lands Between, Plenty of battles raged, but this one against the Giants is the most famous. Marika herself commanded Godfrey to put the Giants to the sword and confine their flame to Mount Gelmir. Afterwards, Godfrey faced the lone Stormlord, and as soon as his foe perished, Marika betrayed him. Yeah, Godfrey was essentially used by Marika and the Greater Will. Marika took his grace away, along with his warriors, 
and drove them from the lands between as to be without grace is to be essentially an omen, which is bad, and I will go into more detail about that in the Morgoth and Mog video. Marika supposedly wanted Godfrey and his warriors to grow strong in the face of death, but it just seems shitty to me to ditch Godfrey as soon as he served his purpose. I could be missing something, but in my opinion, I reckon that Marika knew it was time to reunite herself with Radigan, as Marika and Radigan are the same god, and she just needed to get Godfrey out of the way. So Godfrey went into exile across the ocean with his people, who were now named the Tarnished. Poignantly, one boat was left behind after they left. This journey of theirs was called the Long March, and at the end, Godfrey abandoned his kingship and became Horalu warrior. The next time Godfrey would come to the Lands Between, he does so to reclaim the title of Elden Lord, tenderly caring for Morgoth, one of his sons. In the light of the burning Erdtree, Godfrey is defeated by the Tarnished and acknowledges their strength. Rest in peace, Godfrey. And that's Godric the Grafted and Godfrey the First Elden Lord lore and their role in the events of Elden Ring. This is my third video about the lore of Elden Ring, so make sure to check out the other two videos on Rani, Radan, and Rikard. Next up, I'm going to be doing the twins Morgoth the Omen King and Mog Lord of Blood. This is quite the intense series already. Do you have any other characters or events you're curious about and would like me to cover, apart from the really obvious ones? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, thanks very much, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Eurogamer as we have a new video out every single day. Now, I'm going to go and call Godric some more names because he's pathetic. I'll see you next time.